Imagine for a minute if the watch industry was not run by brand managers and market analysts. If we were actually all enthusiasts in this hobby equally, I think that there would be a very different swing in the pendulum in the dive watch market presently. This is the Seiko SBDC 027, the 50th anniversary sumo, and this is going to be a review talking about how you can get a fantastic watch, a great watch, for under $1,000, and how Seiko has taken their design prowess and their technological prowess to make a watch that's just a recreational diver, and it doesn't need the pretenses of being a professional diving watch to be a great watch. For 99% of the market interested in these kind of watches, this is actually a really good thing. And so this is a study of a watch that in some ways is doing what I think the industry should be doing a lot more. As far as dive watch provenance goes, Seiko has got to be in the top two or three of all watch manufacturers in history. They've done so much to innovate and to produce excellent dive watches at every price category such that when it came time for Seiko's 50th anniversary of their original diving watch, collectors like me were really excited to see that Seiko was releasing a variety of dive watches, including a couple special commemorative limited editions. One of the Sumo, this watch, and another of the Marine Master 300, the professional diving watch. Now, this watch is really fascinating because it's re-envisioning the Seiko Sumo. Like I've already suggested, Seiko is kind of unique in the way that they offer quality dive watches at every price point. So you can get a very nice entry level diver at $100 or you can buy a professional diving watch at over $2,000. The Seiko Sumo fits kind of in the middle at around $500. The earlier rendition of the Seiko Sumo has largely been regarded by collectors as a solid choice amongst a lot of boutique watches or other Japanese watches, but not really a serious watch in comparison to a lot of its Swiss competitors. But I would say that this 50th anniversary limited edition Sumo has a number of refinements that, frankly, bring it to a new level in the design game. Underneath the new sapphire crystal lies a beautifully updated dial. The raised loom-filled rectangular indices are an intentional nod to the 62MAS or the 62MA, Seiko's original diver. The handsomely three-dimensional fluted rectangular hands are certainly reminiscent also of the original, while the second hand is perhaps most similar to the Seiko 6105. Further refinement comes in the bezel, and not only has the font of the Arabic's been updated significantly, there's also been the use of a higher grade of material for the bezel insert. My understanding is it's the same one as the Marine Master 300 Professional, which is a metal bezel insert that's painted and then lacquered and somehow treated to be scratch resistant. The Seiko Sumo's case, which features a variety of brush and polish surfaces and interesting angles and ways that the case resolves, is also die-coated. This is a proprietary product that Seiko uses to ensure that their case is scratched less easily. It's a form of, I think, semi-transparent coating. The case has a slightly more gunmetal color than a standard stainless steel case, but it's of the sort of coating that you can still very easily see the very fine brushing in the satin finish surfaces of the case. To me, the net result of the nod to the old school dial and hands and the frankly dynamic case is very beautiful. This is a very interesting, a visually engaging watch. There's this idea that the avant-garde always has to destroy the past, but this is an interesting synthesis of, frankly, very fresh, very modern case design and elements of technology, and yet, nevertheless, it feels very timeless for this level of watch. This feels like a watch that isn't going to be dated in the blatant way that a lot of cartoonish dive watch design can easily become so. The Sumo case has always been part of the controversy of the Sumo, but I think it's found its home in this design because it's no longer the focus. The recessed and tastefully signed Seiko crown is another one of those features that you're only going to find on a Seiko in this price range. The action on the crown is definitely one of those things where you can tell it's not a trip lock. The quality is consistent. The action 
is predictable between the various settings, and yet it doesn't feel particularly refined. Now, is that a problem? I really don't think it is. I think this is one of those examples where the overall net value of the watch dictates that you're going to not necessarily have a very sophisticated crown system for waterproofing. And you know, you don't need it. This is another area where technical specifications have become an end in themselves, which is ridiculous. This is a fully functional 200 meter water resistance watch. I guarantee that it's going to surpass that water resistance. Seiko always over tests their watches. And the crown, in its very practical 4 o'clock position, is easy to use and easy to adjust. And I think that's all you can really expect from a watch at this price range. Of course, I've mentioned to the Sapphire Crystal, and this is a notable upgrade from the original Sumo, which just uses Seiko's proprietary Hardlex or Mineral Glass Crystal. It's carefully and evenly set inside the case, and there's an ever so slight chamfer in the bezel insert down to the glass that's very beautifully dotted by minute indices. It really is a fantastic look. The design prowess demonstrated by Seiko in this mid-range watch is exceptional. But on the other hand, we do see some cost cutting in the bracelet and clasp in particular. This is a folding dive clasp. It does have both the extra folding clasp and a button lock. And uh, for all intents and purposes, again, it's functional. It definitely feels cheap. This is not really a better class than you would be getting on a lot of the $100 Seikos. You can see it's just a uh, stamp folding clasp, and you do have a, a diver's extension there, and it is fully stainless steel, so again, it's going to be fully functional. It's just not that much of a pleasure to use. It's just not that engaging. This is an area where I would love to see Seiko kind of take it to the next generation. On the wrist, the watch is extremely comfortable. 45 millimeters sounds very intimidating. I get that. It's a size that not everyone's used to, especially if you're used to wearing 40 millimeter ish watches the way that I am. The thing is, is that it's really sculpted in a way so that it feels more like a 42 millimeter watch. It's kind of hard to explain, but there's only a certain amount of points of contact on your wrist, and it's uh, very stable on the wrist. Those curved lugs really come down in a way that uh, the watch just doesn't, doesn't flop around much at all. This is not really a function of size, and a watch that's even small when you shake it like that is going to be something that's going to be uncomfortable. It's just going to rub your wrist in the wrong way. I have fairly flat wrists, and I tend to notice flat, uncomfortable watches. And this is, you know, probably alleviated to some extent by this Seiko bracelet. It is sort of an Oster style bracelet that hugs the wrist in a very comfortable way without really being uh, too special. It's just got a little bit of extra chamfering. I should mention I've been wearing this watch for about two months very consistently and the only place where the die shield seems to have failed is in a very small spot on the clasp. So it seems like it's technology that works. We do have a 120 click bezel as you can see and the feel in the bezel is pretty standard issue for a spring loaded bezel. It's precise enough without feeling insanely crisp and it's definitely easy to operate in spite of the fact that the bezel is semi shrouded. Of course we've got Seiko's proprietary Loom Bright Loom and it is fantastic. Easily swings with the big boys. This is as good as Loom gets on a watch. It will last all night. The watch's case back is fairly unexceptional with the extra printing of the limited edition nature of this watch. This is a 1 of 2000 watch, so make sure you find one if you're interested in getting one right away. You'll see that it's an air diver as opposed to a saturation diver. And you'll also notice that it's a Japanese domestic watch. That's what that large prominent X is, both on the dial and on the case back. Perhaps not my favorite element of the dial, but it does have a little bit of that badge of honor connotation, so for me it'll get a pass. Of course, this being a Seiko, you get an in-house movement even at this price range. And this is the 6R15 movement, an automatic movement that does hack and hand wind. And it has a fantastic 50-hour power reserve, and it's at least that in my experience. The movement is perhaps minimally but tastefully finished and is a decently accurate watch. It's running a little fast for me, but probably not more than 5 seconds a day. There's no doubt that this is about as good of an automatic movement that you can find at this price range. 
As soon as some live pictures were leaked of this watch rather than just the renderings, I knew I wanted one, but I knew it was going to be hard to get one because it was, in fact, just released at the Japanese domestic market. And so I actually was able to get some help from collectors to get in contact with the proper Japanese retailers that were trustworthy and would give me a good price. And uh, it was really a great experience. So I kind of am keeping some of this memorabilia, not just because, you know, it's interesting to see what you'd be getting if you bought this in Japan, but also just because the story of getting it for me was one of collaborating with other collectors and that's you know one of the pleasures of this hobby is that people can give advice and help the knowledge base grow and I definitely felt like this was exploring new territories for me. This watch flies in the face of dive watch conventions these days. I mentioned at the beginning of this video the dive watch market is myopic right now. There's an obsession with insane death ratings and the most bleeding edge technical specifications and it doesn't necessarily make sense for most people. You don't need you know a ceramic case or some sort of proprietary material hairspring in order to have an excellent watch. This watch is just well designed, it's refined, it has a beautiful timeless style of dial that harkens back to uh, true heritage in dive watches and Frankly, it's a market that's just not being explored by major manufacturers right now, and I think that we're worse off for it. The Seiko SBDC 027, the 50th anniversary sumo, is a reminder not only of what Seiko has come from, but what they're still able to do at this price range. And so I think it's a great watch to celebrate Seiko's 50th anniversary, and it's certainly one that I've enjoyed sharing with you today. As always, thank you so much for your time watching my videos. If you haven't subscribed yet, I want to invite you to subscribe. Feel free to check out the other vids linked here. And thanks again.